Welcome back to Anderson Acres. We're in the kitchen again, but we're not baking today. Somebody asked if I could do a series of tips and tricks when it comes to baking. And I thought that was a really good idea because there's a lot that people don't really consider. There's a lot of things you should think about before you get started. So I thought I would start the way a lot of people start, and I want to talk about baking from a cookbook. There are a few little hints and tips that you should think about before you uh, grab your cookbook and start baking. The first cook is the cookbook itself. So this is fairy tale baking. I really like this one because it has a lot of fun things. I have a niece, so it's got a lot of fun recipes to make that she really enjoys. But it can be any cookbook. This is not the point of the uh, video here. This cookbook is just one I grabbed because I've been working from it for my niece. So you get your cookbook. You want to check the reviews before you order your cookbooks. Most of the time these days, people are ordering their cookbooks online. So you can go onto Amazon and look at the reviews. If you've got less than three stars, it's going to be a bad one. Not all cookbooks are created equal. So sometimes you'll get a cookbook where its recipes actually really suck. <laughs> so this one doesn't. This is a good one. Yes, I'll put the link in the description. I promise. I keep forgetting to do that in a lot of my videos. I will, I swear. But... Check the reviews online to make sure it's a decent cookbook before you order it. Once you get it, you open it up to the recipe you want to make. I happen to open up to the white chocolate caramel cake. This is actually a really nice recipe out of this book. Most of these recipes are pretty good. So that's why I use it a lot for my niece because she has a lot of fun with the fairy tale, the little stories that are in it. It's really a lot of fun for people. So you open it up to your cookbook, to your recipe page. There's a couple of things you want to do first. The first thing you want to do is read through your recipe beginning to end before you even think about starting. So read through your ingredient list and then read through each step of your recipe. Every single step beginning to end, make sure you understand everything. You want to know what ingredients you're going to need, how much time you're going to have to allot for this recipe at least. The times they give you will be the minimum amount of time it takes to make this recipe under ideal conditions, expect it to take longer. But you want to read through it carefully to make sure you have everything you need. If you don't understand a term, so if there's a technique that you don't know, you want to find that technique, you can Google it and watch some YouTube videos, for example, on how to do it. So, if, for example, if you don't know how to knead bread and the instructions say to knead your dough, well, you can pop onto YouTube and watch a video about kneading so that you already know how to do it before you start the recipe. Not all recipes are really good for having to pause and learn something, so learn before you start. The other thing you want to do is check your ingredients and how they're measured. So this, it, for example, this cookbook primarily measures in grams. I'm pretty good with grams. I'm Canadian. We kind of do both. So I'm good with cups. I'm good with grams. It's fine. But if you're from Europe, you're not familiar with cups. If you're from the United States, you're really not that familiar with grams. So if the cookbook is in a measuring scale that you do not quite understand, take the time to Google each one to convert it into the scale you're familiar with. So for example, 150 grams of white chocolate, you can pop that into Google and find out exactly how much white chocolate that is in the scale you're used to. In this case, this one happens to say five and a half ounces, so it's fine. <laughs> this one's pretty good for converting for you. But some recipe books are very much written in one scale or the other, and there's not a lot of conversion, and not all of us have a conversion chart. So it is really easy to pop into Google and just Google the conversions. They're all online. So take a moment, do that. You might even want to write down what those conversions are in your notebook so that next time, write in your recipe book in the margins, so next time you don't have to Google it. It's a really good thing to do. Okay, once you've done that, you want to pre-measure your ingredients. I know it sounds like a pain, but that's why I have these little bowls and these big bowls. Yes, I'll put the link to these. I keep forgetting. I have had so many people ask me for the link to these tiny little bowls. I promise <laughs> I'll put the link to those. <laughs> but so you want to get your different measuring bowls. I have these bigger ones for larger ingredients like my flours and my sugars. And I have these smaller ones for things like my salts and sometimes my chocolate and depending on how much I need to add. So you definitely want to get yourself some of these. And the reason I say that is because it is really, really easy to halfway through the recipe realize you actually don't have enough sugar. 
to realize you thought you had a quarter cup, but you actually only have an eighth of a cup. If you sit down and pre-measure and sort all your ingredients into their own little bowls, I know it's a little bit annoying, but you'll notice I do it in all of my videos because that way I know, oh, geez, I only have half a cup of whole wheat flour instead of needing a full cup. Then I can go to the store or not start that recipe, pick a different recipe to work with for the day. So pre-measure your ingredients. I do that all the time. It's a really, really good idea. It just helps you keep track. It helps you make sure you don't have anything missing. And then it makes adding those ingredients easier instead of having to run to the fridge and grab the milk or run to the microwave and melt your butter. You already have done it. So you are ready to go. It helps a lot. I know it's annoying, but it does help. So the other thing I want to point out is when you're cooking, you're baking, you make a big mess. Okay, you're going to have bowls that are full of goop and you're going to have all these little bowls all over the place. Clean up as you go. So if I'm done using these bowls, they go into the dishwasher or the sink immediately. That way I don't have to think about them. They're not in my way. I don't have to wonder, why do I have these little bowls? Nope, they've already gone to the sink. So clean up as you go. It makes your life easier. I know everyone always says clean as you go when you're baking. It's really important. It helps a lot. You don't get as distracted. You don't end up trying to figure out where the salt is because you already used it from your little bowl and then you put the bowl in the sink. So it's just so much easier to stay organized. You want to keep distractions to a minimum as well, at least the first time you make a recipe. Like this white chocolate caramel cake is actually a really easy recipe. But if you've never made it before, you're going to have a couple of stumbles, namely on step four. So <laughs> if you've never done it before, you need to take a minute and compose yourself and figure out what you're doing with each step. Okay, especially when you're boiling things and this one in step four and five, you're doing a lot of boiling. So you want to make sure you don't curdle anything. You need, you need to pay attention. So if you've never made this recipe before or whatever recipe you're working with, you want to minimize your distractions. You don't want to also be watching a show. You don't want to also be, you don't, don't be also doing anything. If it's the first time you've made this, focus on the recipe. Once you've made it a few times, you could do it blindfolded. Like I make a lot of bread. I could make white bread in my sleep. I do not need to be paying attention to make white bread. But the first time you make something, you do need to pay attention. So just make sure that you've minimized your distractions, that you don't skip steps because it's really easy to skip a step if you're not paying attention. Like, oh, did I do step three? Why does my recipe look weird? Because you missed step three. You forgot to combine the flour. <laughs> So you want to make sure that you are going step by step and you're not distracted. My final little tip for this video, I will come back and do more tip videos and talk about ingredients and such. But my final tip for this video is to relax and enjoy baking. It should be a pleasure. You should have fun. It's not a chore. Take your time, enjoy what you're doing, let your creativity flow, get creative, have a lot of fun, and don't worry too much about how long they say a recipe should take. So it just tells you this cook cake should be cooked in an hour and it takes you an hour and a half because it took you longer to get through these steps. That's fine. Just relax. Remember times that they give you, except for baking times, baking times are pretty scientific, but preparation times are based on ideal conditions for someone who's done this a bunch of times. So relax, have fun. Don't be afraid to get a little bit creative. That's about all I have to say about uh, baking from a cookbook. I will come back and do some short videos on different types of ingredients that you may end up using. So it's really important that you pay attention to the cookbook the first time, follow the ingredients, follow the recipe directions to a T, and you should get at least a somewhat decent result. Then you can start playing around with it. That's about it for us here at Anderson Acres. We'll see you tomorrow.